Hey there, welcome to Rave Culture Cast, a podcast dedicated to fans of EDM and music festival culture. My name is Emma Capotis, a festival fanatic and dance music enthusiast who turned my passion for raving into an online career working with some of the biggest names in the industry. Festival tips, advice, hot topics, industry news, music, and more are all discussed here. Think of me as your unofficial rave mom here to help you navigate the EDM community and festival world. Tune in every Wednesday for your weekly dose of peace, love, unity, and respect. Hey guys, welcome back to Rave Culture Cast, your weekly guide to the EDM community, music festivals, and more. I'm your host, Emma Capotis. Happy Wednesday, fam. I hope we're all doing well out there. I want to dive straight into today's episode because we have a lot in store for you, and this is a super important topic um, that came up for a couple reasons that I'll dive into in a second, but I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for being here. Um, it's been an amazing journey so far and I've you know really been working hard in these last few episodes so I hope you guys are enjoying the different topics and guests and everything but I am always looking for your feedback so um, you can connect with us at Rave Culture Cast on all of the socials. We have an amazing Facebook group community and Discord as well. All the links will be down below um, but let's dive into today's episode. So I am welcoming back Rachel Clark from Dance Safe, who was on, I believe it was about a year ago, um, which I'm going to call part one of this series. We talked about safety around substance use because Dance Safe is an organiza- a nonprofit organization that is helping with harm reduction in the live events space. Um, and Rachel Clark does all of their social media, amongst many other things. She's been involved with the company for many years now um, and is an incredible resource. So you're going to get a ton of value out of today's episode. I do want to give a quick trigger warning because we are going to talk about subjects around um, substance use, and safety and music festivals so if any of these situations are triggering to you I just wanted to let you know because we are going to be talking about some serious subjects here so this all came about um, from an experience I had at Electric Forest which I shared on the podcast in my review and it was also featured in my vlogs so if you guys didn't see any of that information just to fill you in really quickly um, essentially the last day of Electric Forest during the second to last set my group did witness a medical emergency um At the time, we obviously weren't sure exactly what had happened, but um, after the event, we had witnessed uh, two people become unconscious in front of us who collapsed on the floor at the AAA stage. It was obviously a very traumatizing experience for all of us to witness. Um, I was able to get the people medical attention, um, and they were carted away, and we later found out that everybody survived and was okay, which was obviously extremely I don't even know the words to say it just was like I I just cried because I was just so happy that everybody in the situation was okay and we were able to get them the help that they needed but after the fact um Dan Safe was contacted by somebody by the person involved in the situation so they got kind of like the inside scoop as to what had happened um we don't have you know the exact full story but they did recount um in their eyes what happened in that situation so Rachel's going to be shedding a little bit of light Um, on that electric forest situation and then we're just going to be speaking about what to do in these situations either for yourself for your friends for strangers like how do you handle somebody becoming unconscious and again it's not just from substance use but from dehydration or anything else Um, she's going to be giving really valuable information on test kits um, what to do if you think substances you have are contaminated um, and just in general like how to respond to a medical emergency if you need to assist in some instance um, and what to not make assumptions about as well which I think is really important because it's not fair to just assume that obviously somebody might be unconscious or not breathing because of substance use so she's going to talk a lot about how to actually assess the situation what to do, what to do after the fact, how to recover from something like that. So again, we're going through a lot. I just wanted to preface all of this because we jump right into the conversation. I didn't even really do an intro to Rachel at all. We literally just started talking about it. So we're going to hop like right in in the middle of a conversation. But again, highly recommend going out to check out um, my previous episode about safety around substance use because in that one we talk a lot more about substances test kits 
all that kind of stuff. Um, I will have tons of links of resources below from Dance Safe. Please give them a follow. It's super important to be knowledgeable about harm reduction in this space. Um, so that is kind of everything we're going to cover. Really quickly, I just wanted to share um, a message from some of our sponsors. Um, also talking about harm reduction in this space, you guys, I want you to protect your hearing. You need to wear earplugs at music festivals. I know it's like a hot topic, but there are high fidelity earplugs that you can use, which preserves the quality of the sound. So you're not blocking out the sound of the music. We're not here to ruin your experience but you don't want to get long-term damage or something like tinnitus, um, which is the ringing in your ear that you can get that can have permanent effects. Um, so Zound is the company I've been using for years. They make an amazing high quality, um, high fidelity earplug. Uh, they're silicone. They fit right in your ear. Um, so they fit all different size ears. And they're absolutely amazing. The quality is so good. Um, and it just protects from the dangerous levels of decibels from the speakers. It doesn't matter if you're in the front or in the back. I highly encourage wearing them to festivals, to shows, whatever it may be. I always carry the little like canister. Um, it's attached to my hydration pack. And then I have one attached to my snack pack because I just don't want to forget them for events. So they just permanently stay on there. So they're always on me, but um, my discount code is Emma K. That will save you 10% off at Zound. Again, Emma K for 10% off at Zound. Go pick up a pair of earplugs, you guys. You will not regret it. All right, let's dive into our festival fact of the week. So this week, I just wanted to highlight what the Rave Act is because we do mention this a couple times in the episode. And if you're not familiar, you might just be a little bit confused. Um, but the Rave Act makes it easier for prosecutors to fine and imprison business owners, property owners, and rave promoters, not for their own wrongdoing, but for failing to prevent drug-related offenses committed by customers, employees, tenants, or other persons on their property. Um so I believe this was, yeah, this was first proposed. The, electric, the Electronic Music Community organized sustained opposition to the bill, and then it died in Congress. And then in April 2003, the Rave Act renamed the Illicit Drug Anti-Proliferation Act of 2003, snuck through con Congress as an attachment to the Amber Alert bill. While the official name has changed, it's still the same old Rave Act with the same original problems. And this is from the ACLU.org. So essentially what's wrong with the rave act is that it basically makes event promoters and anybody who's organizing raves not want to have any harm reduction companies on site at festivals because they think that that's like promoting drug use at their events so they kind of just shy away from even having them or mentioning them because they don't want to get in trouble for basically like promoting any type of substance use even though harm reduction companies are saving lives um, because these things are going to be done at these events all the time anyway um, so there's just like a lot of issues around the rave act but that's why in america you won't see like a lot of harm reductionists on site as much as you would see in like europe so that's what the rave act is um, we are going to talk about that a little bit today just because we are talking about harm reduction um, on site at events and what you can do in case of emergencies so that is our fact of the week. With that being said, this intro was very long today, but I want to dive in because Rachel Clark from Dance Safe has a ton of helpful information, you guys. Um, a lot going on in this video. It's super random. She's in London, so I'm glad that she could even take this call. Uh, but she's also has like two ferrets with her. This is the first ferret uh, that we have on the podcast making a, making an appearance on the podcast, but they're super cute. So if you see like a lot of edits and things like that, uh, the ferrets were going wild. So just had to throw that out there. It's super random. But yeah, you guys, you guys will know what I mean. Uh, highly recommend watching the YouTube video <laughs> for this episode. Um, with all that being said, thank you, Rachel, for being on here. And please join me in welcoming her to the podcast today. Hi. Hi. It's been a long time. How's it going? I'm in a ferret room right now. Okay. <laughs> the ferrets just got taken out by dad, but um, I'm in a room where the ferrets live. Oh so my God. I'm trying to configure myself. <laughs> where are you right now? England. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's so so awesome. I'm very literally in a ferret room and there's like flies in the ferret room and <laughs> I'm trying to make sure that my Wi-Fi is going to work. Like it's, there's so much happening right now. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for like hopping on this episode so quickly. It like, I just very much feel, 
like I have certain things planned and then other things I'm like, nope, like this thing happened and I want to talk about it like ASAP. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is an important, important episode. So before we even start, like, how are things going? How's everything with dance safe and how you've been feeling? Yeah. So dance safe is, um, honestly, we're currently in the middle of like a tsunami. There's so much mm. going on with this outreach season that we are all busting our asses like mm-hmm. it has been the most chaotic six month period probably in the history of the org if I had to say wow. like we're yeah there's so much going on so mm-hmm. we've had to kind of slow our roll on a lot of different haha on mm-hmm. a lot of different fronts just because there's like there's no way for us to possibly balance everything that's happening right now mm-hmm. um and it's like every week there's something new that requires us paying attention to it so wow. Yeah, it's, I mean, things are great. Like we're getting more traction and visibility exponentially every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the problem is that there's so much demand right now that we're just like stretching right. our britches to try to keep up, you know? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I saw the thing with Grizz as well that you guys are doing, right? Yeah. Like launching a whole <laughs> we'll new program. Every Grizz show this year. Wow. Wow. No, I saw, I saw that. And I'm sure just like, obviously given everything like happening in the world right now, like, like you said, there's been a lot of, growth but also probably like you said more eyes on your page um yeah. so I can't even imagine how that's been but uh I just still appreciate yeah. everything everything you guys are doing and I actually was working with um Jess party saver with Jess for a while was one oh, of my coaching clients we love Jess. yeah yeah she's amazing so I was working with her for like six months um and just like seeing how she's grown and what she's doing is really really cool too and actually like with the electric forest thing that happened. I like talked to you guys and talked to Jess immediately because she wasn't there at the time, but I was like, oh my God, Mm -hmm. this is, yeah, we're still unpacking everything that happened with that. It was a lot. Yeah. And I have some, um, some tidbits that I can share about that whole situation here. Actually, Mm -hmm. um, the plan was for me to write a response publicly about some additional follow-up information that we received, Mm -hmm. but I have only had the opportunity and the time to take it to Twitter, really. I don't even know when I'll have the chance to publish a follow-up article. So I can speak right. verbally to it here. And this might be the only place that I speak verbally to it. So sure. enjoy that yeah. when it comes. Oh my gosh. Well, no, I, w- I was curious too. Cause like, did the actual people themselves reach out, reach out to you or is a friend? I don't know if you can re- say that information. This isn't for the podcast, just for me. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, and this, this can be shared on the podcast too. Um, so what ended up happening is that a few weeks ago, someone contacted, and I have, I have um, permission to kind of like relay the general information, mm-hmm. um, no identifying information, of course, but someone reached out to us and said, um, I was one of the people who was uh, a suspected overdose. Mm-hmm. And so were two of my friends. And gotcha. uh, here is what happened from our perspective. So okay. that is the perspective that I have obtained mm-hmm. um, through direct conversation. And um, the gist of it, basically, which I'll just go ahead and spoil now, the gist of it was that um, there were some folks in a campsite, one of their friends dropped a pill on the ground, um, like the friends of these people, like they knew this person, dropped a pill on the mm-hmm. ground, and um, someone and their group of three picked it up, split it into six pieces. Um, this person took two pieces and two of the friends took a piece each or some configuration Mm -hmm. like that doesn't really matter. Um, and then I want to say it was like an hour passed and they, there was no like symptom onset necessarily. They had Mm -hmm. had felt like they were rolling, um, and then, uh, lost consciousness Mm -hmm. and all three of them. And, uh, so I was uh, shown some communications with an eyewitness who actually was like a stranger who saw this happen and who was the one that brought medical over. And um, this person said that they saw two people who were in kind of like in and out of consciousness and one person mm-hmm. who was unconscious and not breathing. And so CPR and rescue rest were administered to the person who was not breathing by medical. All three were given a dose of Narcan. And they were brought back to the medical tent and then discharged because they mm-hmm. just like okay. felt two of them felt kind of sick for the rest of the night. Um, but the, the third one was okay. Um, mm-hmm. None of them went to the hospital. 
And the issue in the situation was that they were embarrassed about having taken a ground score. So they told the medics that they had only taken mushrooms, um, which they had. They had taken mushrooms and had like a few drinks. Um, but they also explicitly told medics, we don't think this is because of the mushrooms, because they were basically trying to be like, well, we only took mushrooms, but you really we're not going to tell you everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they oh, were trying geez, to okay. insinuate, like, don't focus on that. You know, we know sure. that that's not an issue. Um, and there's a ton that I could talk about there. Like, there's so much to unpack right. just in that process. Um, and I don't know if you saw the article that I released about context clues and like the contextual likelihood of how. Mm. Evaluate. Like, did you get an opportunity to check that out? I don't out? think so. No, I just read the all of the tweets that you shared. Yeah, at the time I saw the fly. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's the gist of that situation. So before that was even released, I wrote an article that I highly recommend checking out, mm -hmm. where I pulled a scale out of my ass that I really like and I'm going to use forever <laughs> now, um, of one through four in terms of the likelihood of something being legitimate that's mm -hmm. published or stated about drugs. So it goes from um, proven false, contextually unlikely, contextually likely to proven true or confirmed true, confirmed false, whichever. Um, so I deemed this situation contextually unlikely because it didn't have evidence explicitly against it. And following this evidence, I am tentatively deeming the situation confirmed false. Now, mm -hmm. the reason that it isn't fully confirmed false is because even though I received this direct firsthand account with corroboration from eyewitnesses mm -hmm. via text, as well as text communications between this person and the friend who dropped the pill despite those things we still don't have any contact with the medics i also okay. wanted to um jump in really quickly too and it's if it's cool with you I'm, i was just gonna say we'll just leave obviously like we're doing it raw we didn't just jumped right into everything but um yeah <laughs> for, for, literally but you know guys rachel clark has been on the podcast before i'm gonna link our the first episode we did together um, which was about safety around substance use. And then we're, we're talking about the situation that happened at electric forest that I shared on my podcast. And then in, in my vlogs that happened on the, the fourth, well, from what I had seen in my personal experience, I could chat about that too, was on the fourth day of electric forest, like the second to last set. Um, we had witnessed uh, people who had apparently fainted or, you know, lost consciousness at the Tripoli stage. Um, and then I had reached out to Dan safe and, and my friend party safer with Jess, because you guys all work with harm reduction and was just chatting with you and shared my experience. So we're, you know, Rachel had information from the people involved. Um, so that's kind of what we're talking about here, but before we go any further, thank you again for coming on the podcast. Sorry. I really appreciate <laughs> being here. We're, this is how it's going to go because yeah, there's just so much to cover it's just here. The so, open, yeah. you know? Like <laughs> it, it just in the last two months, since the first true festival season, since mm -hmm. 2019 has started, everything has just gone bananas. Like yeah. there's so much to unpack with this festival season. I can't even imagine. Yeah, no, I, I think we spoke, it was at least last summer. I want to say it was the episode I could mm -hmm. actually pull up the date, but um, yeah, that I just received so much, so many comments from that episode. It was so valuable, the information we covered. And we, I think we, you know, we had talked about the festival festival industry right now is in a different place than it was even a year ago. Um, oh, so there's different. still, yeah. yeah, still the excitement there are people going really hard, um, back at events. And I've talked a little bit about burnout with events too, on a recent episode, but yeah. So back to the electric forest story, we kind of wanted to dive yeah. in there because that's the reason we had connected and decided to do this episode too, was because of this yeah. situation. Um, and we're going to cover super quickly. Let me just throw this out there, you guys. So we're going to talk a little bit about safety at events, um, what resources to look for on site. We're going to chat test kits, um, identifying and reporting contaminated drugs. And then I definitely want to talk a lot more about handling medical emergencies um, and much more. So anyway, now that that's kind of like our intro <laughs> mid podcast, uh, back to the electric forest story. So after the, um, so you did not hear from any medics, Dan safe, didn't speak to anybody, mm -hmm. right? From that situation. Right. Okay. Right. So um, here is, because this is the question that I've been getting asked, like, mm -hmm. I swear, man, working in this industry, something like this happens and I wake up the next morning and I have like 150 messages Jeez. on my personal platforms from everyone who's ever drawn breath being like, is this true? Mm -hmm. And understandably so. So as just like a point of reflection, how I view the situation, having the information that I was provided by this person who was a firsthand witness is as follows. Number one, 
if someone took a pill off the ground, ate it, and then had like an hour where they felt like they were rolling, the likelihood of there being fentanyl in that pill is extraordinarily low. Mm -hmm. Um, If you, I mean, like it is the, I guess, I don't know, the, the pharmacokinetics of taking a drug orally like fentanyl are not something that I have off the top of my head that I can just mm-hmm. say. Um, but I would find it to be extremely unlikely that it would take longer than like maybe 30 minutes for mm-hmm. something like that ingested in that way to kick in. Um, exceptions to this, because there are always exceptions, include if you're a slow metabolizer, if you have other drugs in your system that change your metabolic rate, if you have a really, really full stomach, but, mm-hmm. um, or if you are taking a drug that is administered, co-administered, so administered alongside another drug that would interrupt its metabolic breakdown. So for instance, if you take two drugs that are both broken down by the same enzyme and one mm-hmm. of them takes priority in that breakdown over another, then that could delay the onset of the second drug. So okay. an interesting example of this is one um, b otherwise known as B or BD, which is a pro-drug of GHB. So it gets converted mm-hmm. into GHB in the body. Um, 1,4-B and alcohol um, tend to have a more complicated interaction than other kinds of G and alcohol because 1,4-B will get broken down in a different, I forget which gets Mm -hmm. broken down first, actually. Um, It might be 1,4-B gets broken down first and then alcohol gets broken down. So you suddenly feel the effects of both of them concurrently Mm -hmm. after some time has passed. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's just like one example of how it's kind of hard to tell, but the fact that someone could be like, I felt like I was rolling and then shortly thereafter or like an hour mm-hmm. thereafter would suddenly like black out and have no recollection until coming to with EMS standing over them. I don't have an explanation for that. Mm-hmm. Um, there are so many things that could be in a pill like that. There could be an opioid, some sort of synthetic opioid, I mm-hmm. suppose, I guess it could be that there was um, some kind of like a novel stimulant that caused cardiac arrest in three people spontaneously, which wouldn't match the symptoms of nod. Like, right, right. I have no idea. And mm-hmm. neither does anybody else, no matter what they say, mm-hmm. unless we send the shit to a lab, which we can't. Jeez. So I have a question um, on that yeah. really quick too. Cause it, cause even just for other people who like, obviously all we're saying all of this to like, keep people safe, to make sure that the situation, whether it, they are the person or they witness it if they Mm -hmm. are breaking a pill into multiple pieces too could it also be the instance though where like say fentanyl was involved that like it could affect one person Mm -hmm. versus not everybody else because also like this was a pill in this instance but say this was cocaine or something like that like I know when Jess came on um I think she talked about like the chocolate chip cookie yeah, effect cookie where it, that's right you could take bites of the cookie but unless you take the bite with the chocolate chip in it that has fentanyl in it you would assume that this was clean so could mm-hmm. that also be the instance too where like potentially it could have they could have gotten like a bad piece or a contaminated piece yeah. I mean it is theoretically possible and it also there are just so many pieces in the story that don't add up mm-hmm. um like one of the main ones being that we still have yet to see an actual lab confirmed case of uh, MDMA contaminated with fentanyl. Like it is just not a thing that we're seeing happening. Mm -hmm. Um, There, I think was one case that was clearly due to accidental cross-contamination because often when that, when it happens in kind of like an anomaly sort of way, like that one time that we saw an Adderall pill that was legitimately contaminated with fentanyl, Mm -hmm it was a trace quantity. It was barely picked up by the instruments. Mm -hmm. So um, fentanyl test strips are really, really sensitive. They'll pick up really, really tiny quantities of fentanyl. So even if a pill is is cross-contaminated, that doesn't necessarily mean that there would be enough fentanyl present Mm -hmm. to cause psychoactive effects. Um, Additionally, this still doesn't change the fact that the symptoms don't really match a fentanyl overdose Mm -hmm. or an opioid overdose in general. Um, There's like confusing language around, oh, a loss of consciousness. Oh, Mm -hmm. someone stopped breathing. Like what happened leading up to that is really critical. Right. Right. So um, yes, the chocolate chip cookie effect could apply. I would again, deem it to be contextually unlikely in the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, one rare exception that I might say of all the unlikely things that might be more com- or more likely could be something like, okay, pill contains tramadol, for instance, which is mm-hmm. 
opioid that also has serotonergic properties and has a lot of interactions and is therefore theoretically, I suppose, an illicit tramadol pill could, could take mm-hmm. fentanyl. It could be a mystery bag pill. It could be yeah. anything. Like I know. I'm like, there's no endless <laughs> options no here. Idea. Well, I yeah. mean, I, I think this is really helpful to talk about. And I know I, I want to keep us on track because I know there's a couple of things I want to talk about here, but to kind of yeah, like sorry. wrap up. No, 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 no. Just because I want to like, I have, a, I want to jump around, but I think it's kind of more important since we're already talking about this scenario to talk about the medical emergencies next, but yes. just to yes. wrap up this scenario, I want to chat really quickly too about the mushrooms, just because if anybody else mm-hmm. went to electric forest, or even if you were just online and you follow bunk police, um, they had tweeted out that night, which I didn't, I was not signed up for the text at the time, but when we got back to our campsite at the end of the night, one of the people in our campgrounds had mentioned that. So then, um, our group, obviously that night went to bed thinking like, oh my God, is this a world we live in where there's like fentanyl laced mushrooms? Because this text message Mm -hmm. was sent out saying like, do not eat mushrooms. If you're at electric forest, like there's these reports. So do you have any thoughts on, on that scenario? (laughs) Yes, very much so. Um, Oh God, it's going to be hard to keep them simple though. (laughs) So um, a few main things. Number one, there is a mass confusion around why fentanyl is in the drug market at all. Um, being more familiar with the reason why fentanyl entered the drug market is really helpful for kind of understanding where it would reasonably show up and the reason for that. Mm -hmm. So um, this trope that dealers are trying to get people more addicted is when they're adding fentanyl to Mm -hmm. cocaine, which as of right now, the most contextually likely explanation remains accidental cross-contamination. There are more conspiracy theories out there about that, that are, they don't have substantial proof either way. Mm -hmm. Um, People have a reason to mistrust the United States government around drugs. It is not unfounded, but we have to be mindful of being neutral in our observation Mm -hmm. to ensure that we're directing our energy to the right place. Um, because if we go on down this rabbit hole of like, oh, the government is trying to kill people that use psychedelics now, then it's like, okay, is it theoretically possible? Sure, it's theoretically possible. Mm-hmm. Is it the thing that we should be focusing on? I really don't think so. That's kind right. of like where I'm at with this. So fentanyl ends up in the drug supply. Usually we think because of cross-contamination, packaging on the same surfaces, using the same tools, et cetera, usually would happen in facilities that are processing similar kinds of substances. And mm-hmm. mushrooms are frequently grown in facilities that do not cross package or cross produce other substances. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they are, often they're not. Um, and also the only way for fentanyl to end up in mushrooms is for it to be dusted on the top, I suppose. Right. And even then a, a dusting quote unquote would be like a grain of sand. Mm-hmm. So you can see how it would be really easy for that to be a complete and total accident. Mm-hmm. And also if you just go, <laughs> right, you know, mm-hmm. um, you're not going to get high on fentanyl by touching a speck of it. That's not right. how it works. Um, so generally speaking, I really, really cannot recommend my article on this more, mm-hmm. honestly, because it, it gives you a metric by which you can kind of evaluate the likelihood of these things being true so that it's, a, it's easier to process information like this without feeling like suddenly the rug's been pulled out from underneath you. Mm-hmm. Was everything that I thought I knew wrong? Is everything different now? That kind of right. feeling. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, cause I think, um, obviously it, it just, it scared a lot of people. I think I'm witnessing it was really scary, but I think yeah. just having the information afterwards where you were able to, to speak to people involved and then kind of like debunk what actually happened and, you know, I read Bunk Police's article um, on the situation as well, which I think think was on Reddit. Um, it it just obviously is like a really tricky subject, right? Because festival organizers themselves can only do so much with harm reduction because of the mm-hmm. Rave Act. So, in that scenario, yeah, I know. In that scenario, um, we'll we'll talk another time about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in that scenario, it was kind of like. I guess I left wondering, okay, like how, what happens, you know, God forbid this happens the next time. Like, how can I use my platform for another person that's in this situation? Or like, was that the right steps to take? Like, I just kept thinking Mm -hmm. to myself, like what happens next? Um, How do we get the right information into like Dan Safe's hands or Bunkley's or another harm reductionist hands? 
Um, how do we find out what actually happened? How do we prevent this from happening in the future? And then, you know, what, what can organizers or like staff on site also learn from these scenarios too? So I think that's kind of where this, like how to handle medical emergencies situation arose. Um, and yeah. I, we have a couple of things we want to talk about guys too. It's not just, um, about like a fentanyl or a parent overdose. Sorry if I don't use the correct terminology too. Like, That's okay. I know you're going to okay. school me. <laughs> like yeah. I, know I don't say the right fucking thing. I'll be gentle. Um, but we have like, we, you know, dehydration is a huge issue at events too, which we've talked about injury. Like there's so many other things that like, I'm sure the medical staff sees all day long um, at events. But I guess my question in this scenario is like for somebody in this situation, how would you handle something like this, um, if you witness this happening. And I guess we could start with, um, if you see somebody losing, uh, losing consciousness in front of you at an event. So glad we're talking about this because yeah. I, I, so I have an article that is almost ready to be published. So keep an eye out for it. It's going through pretty rigorous review. Mm -hmm. Um, that is just an article that is all about how to figure out why someone might've passed out and mm -hmm. how to respond generally speaking, um, big topic. So yeah. someone drops in front of you. First thing that you do call for a medical professional. It's pretty mm -hmm. simple. Um, one of the biggest things that medics report pisses them off at festivals is when people are like trying to crowd around and help out and see what's going on. If you see someone drop, clear a space, like mm -hmm. make a bubble around this person um, have someone go and flag down medics, stay calm while you're doing it, which might sound counterintuitive, but, or it might sound basic. I mean, like everyone's mm -hmm. always like, stay calm in an emergency. And it's like, fuck, you're going to stay calm. Like, so you just watch someone hit the ground in front of you. You're going to freak out. Yeah. Um, but if you stay calm while you're conveying information, you'll do it more accurately. So if you can allow yourself to like, take the extra 0.3 seconds to observe your surroundings, um, it's really a good idea to um, see if someone around you has a flag or something so you can pull them in and be like, hey, can you like make sure that you stand right here with this person with your flag? Mm -hmm. We're going to tell medics that your flag is here. Super important to actually get that person on board, though, because if you don't, they're just going to wander off with their flag. Mm -hmm. um, not sure if you can hear that there's a ferret that desperately wants to get into this room right now and is scratching <laughs> at the door. <laughs> Um, I'm going to let the first in the podcast. Yeah. 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 yeah let's get no, the spirit good. in here. Yeah. <laughs> We've never had a fairy guest on the podcast. Oh my Hi. God. This is Ed. So cute. cute. Anyway. So Keep first going. thing to do is <laughs> clear yeah. a path for medical professionals, et cetera. Um, if someone is, if you feel comfortable doing so, the first thing to do is take note of what you witnessed first and foremost. So for mm -hmm. instance, did this person suddenly drop to the ground? Did this person kind of seem out of it in any way um, prior to losing consciousness? When they're on the ground losing consciousness, can you see them breathing normally? Is their breathing slow? Um, are they not breathing? Is this person making vomiting sounds or has they, have they vomited nearby or on themselves? Um, as many mm -hmm. observations as you can keep note of to pass on to the medics will be incredibly helpful for a differential diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if someone loses consciousness fairly quickly or is like, I don't feel very well, guys, like, oh, I just, I feel kind of like sick and my heart's racing and like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like nauseous or whatever else, um, that neither of those things matches symptoms of an opioid overdose. And because of the true prevalence of fentanyl right now, it's really important to give information like that to medical providers, because if they just show up and someone's on the ground, they're not going to know what happened beforehand. Mm -hmm. And that's the information we're usually missing most to make an evaluative statement is how quickly, what were the symptoms before someone went down? Um, if someone is not breathing and if you cannot feel their heartbeat, then you'll want to, first of all, everyone should take a CPR class. Like mm -hmm. seriously, everyone should take a CPR class so mm -hmm. that you know how to identify the symptoms of when someone needs CPR administered versus rescue breaths or they're fine and they don't need anything. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really important. And from there, there are just like a lot of things that people misunderstand about opioid overdose. Like opioid overdose is like someone falls asleep. They don't, people are, are not going to be like, I think I'm overdosing. Mm -hmm. I need Narcan. Right. Um, if that were the case, people who use opioids would just Narcan themselves mm -hmm. instead of losing consciousness. 
Um, even just that first point, I want to stop on that super quickly because this is all like, even it's, if it seems basic information, it's not because a lot of people haven't been in these scenarios and like, just to throw some things in the mix, like what we had witnessed happened so quickly. And again, like there's so many overstimulating things happening. Like we're mm-hmm. watching a show. I was drunk at the time. Like it was the second mm-hmm. to last show of the night. Um, you know, so we didn't, I was not paying attention to anything that happened to this person beforehand. Cause I'm watching the stage right. and hanging out with right. my friends. I just, in this scenario, it was just a friend turning around to us saying like, he's not breathing. And I just look on the floor and just see a body on the floor. So that like, we had no mm-hmm. context of anything, but I totally agree with the remaining calm and keeping your yourself composed um, and getting medical help. Cause that's like literally the first thing I could think of. I was like, know exactly where the medical tent is right printing over there that's like all I know to do right now while like the rest of our group was asking around for Narcan but um yeah I agree with you I I believe Electric Forest actually was doing CPR classes within the campgrounds as well they had that as one of the things so now I know next time I will be taking that but um great points to start with (laughs) because there are there are a lot of reasons why someone might lose consciousness and now everyone Mm -hmm. just assumes that if someone loses consciousness a they're not breathing B, it's right. an opioid overdose. Right. And it's honestly usually neither of those things. Mm-hmm. Usually when someone passes out, oftentimes it's just from syncope, which is fainting. Mm-hmm. Um, syncope is more common than people realize it is. Sometimes, I, I mean, I I get vasovagal syncope, which is actually like a recurrent condition where sometimes mm-hmm. I'll wake up in the middle of the night feeling like I'm going to die. Like it's like a the worst panic attack ever. And you break out into cold sweats and you have really fast heart rate, like panic attacks feel like you are dying. Mm -hmm. And very, very often, because everyone is reading news articles about so-called injection attacks and people blowing powder into people's faces Mm -hmm. and um, other stuff pertaining to fentanyl, we get tons of people tagging us in, dance safe, dance safe, I was dosed, help me figure out what I was dosed with, here's what happened. And almost every single time, if someone's like someone blew powder into my face in the crowd, or um, I felt this prick in my neck or something like that, I'll be like, you fainted, like you mm-hmm. fainted because you had a sudden, very frightening experience because you've read that someone might have harmed you. Right. And it's hard to say that without being mm-hmm. really invalidating of that person's experience. But it's like, it's understandable that you would faint sure. from fear. Right, um, right. So if someone suddenly loses consciousness, that is not consistent with opioid overdose. Yeah. If just because you give someone Narcan and they wake up afterwards, it does not mean that they overdosed on an opioid. Mm-hmm. That is a huge point because right now it is standard practice for medics to Narcan people who are unconscious at festivals and in general. So it's mm-hmm. really important to not operate under the assumption that that means, oh, I should tell everyone that there was a a fentanyl overdose in front of me at this stage. That's a huge Mm -hmm. issue. No. And I mean, can we back it up too really quickly for people who may not know what exactly is Narcan? Because I'm seeing this everywhere now. So what exactly is it? um, And why, why is it all of a sudden being spoken about so frequently? So Narcan is an opioid overdose reversal agent. And the, the way that it works is that when an opioid, you actually produce endogenous opioids, opioids in your body, like endorphins, for instance, are opioids. Mm-hmm. Um, when you ingest an opioid, it, there are three different kinds of opioid receptors that it can wedge itself into and they each have slightly different effects. So mm-hmm. what happens is that an opioid will wedge itself into the receptor and Narcan or Naloxone, Narcan is a brand name, will come in and kind of with a crowbar wedge it out and stick itself in there instead. So um, it, it blocks an opioid from binding in a receptor and doing its thing. Mm. And the issue is that Narcan is a temporary reversal agent. So if people have ingested a very large quantity of an opioid, it is possible theoretically for an hour or two to pass and for the Narcan to wear off and for them to overdose again. Mm. So um, it's really important for people to continue being monitored, especially by medical professionals, even after Narcan has been administered, because if Mm. they're not, there is a non-negligible chance if there was, again, it really depends on how much was ingested. For sure. Um, But it does consider it a Band-Aid in a way? Like it, is it like a quick fix or not? Okay. 
Gotcha. Not necessarily. Um, a lot depends, again, on the dose of the opioid, the specific opioid involved, and the half-life of the opioid involved. So how mm-hmm. long that opioid lasts. And mm-hmm. that's something where without advanced drug checking, you can't really know which one you're dealing with. So Narcan is not, I, I don't think I would call it a Band-Aid, but it is mm-hmm. definitely like a reversal agent that might need to be reapplied. Okay. Um, that makes so sense. So one quick thing I want to myth bust here there is this really pervasive idea that if you give someone Narcan, if you give just like a random layperson Narcan who is um, overdosing on fentanyl and does not do opioids regularly, that they could come out swinging at you. That is, I would I would say, I'm not going to use extremes and absolutes, mm-hmm. but I would generally say that that will almost always be limited to people who are going through precipitative withdrawal, which means that you have removed opioids from the opioid receptors in their body and they are now entering into immediate withdrawal which can be extremely uncomfortable or even physically painful and quite emotionally distressing Mm. Um, but that only happens if someone is physically dependent on opioids already right Right. Um, and in this uh, case we we wouldn't know that but for right who we would assume would be at the events and things like that in this kind of scenario it would yeah. be more more likely that um, they'd be able to administer that. And then like in this scenario that it could be saving somebody's life. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and usually someone will just come out confused and sometimes scared. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone actually is in an opioid overdose state and you reverse the overdose and there's 10 people standing around them freaking out, they will mm-hmm. probably start crying. They might have a panic attack. Right. They'll be like, I don't remember what happened. I don't know what happened. What happened? So there are ways to approach people when they come out of a state of really just any state of being unconscious from unconscious to conscious again mm-hmm. um, to explain very calmly and gently like, hey, here's where you are. Um, mm-hmm. Here's what day it is. Here's what just happened. Here's the people that are around you right now. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I gave you Narcan. I don't know if you overdosed, but I gave it to you just to be safe. But usually I would recommend not saying that unless you know that someone was in an opioid overdose, because okay. otherwise yep. that might freak them out and then they'll tell right. everyone on the sun. Yeah. You know, you want to just be like, hey, you lost consciousness. The medics are here. Um, we're not really sure what happened, but you're safe. We're figuring it out. Perfect. Okay. I want to, I, I have a couple more questions about this because I kind of want to like this is probably going to be the whole episode itself but this is like such an important lesson and Rachel I'm gonna have you back and back (laughs) for multiple parts but we'll come back because there's so much to do but no I think it's also important because another thing I want to stress to people listening who who really want to to learn about this and be able to help in these scenarios so for somebody would you recommend people carry narcan because i also want to be clear here mm-hmm. like your point about getting medical help i also want to be clear here that you still want to seek help here i don't want everybody going around mm-hmm. thinking that they'll be able to just like administer narcan themselves and give chest compressions and like don't even need to go get medical attention you know unless you happen to be like a nurse or something like that in the crowd which i actually know somebody who was but do you recommend that people carry Narcan? Um, and again, like how how would the average person like handle a situation like this? Um, I do recommend that people carry Narcan. The first time mm-hmm. that you use Narcan in the wild will change your life permanently. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important to note that if you're going to carry Narcan, carry it everywhere, not just at festivals. Mm-hmm. Because festivals represent an extremely privileged subset of people who use drugs who are significantly less likely to come across fentanyl in their environments and festivals Mm -hmm. um, than people who are actively using opioid-like substances on a daily basis elsewhere, Mm -hmm. um, or just other drugs that are more prone. Like for instance, the the benzo market, we were seeing more fentanyl in it a a little while ago. I haven't really been seeing much for a bit. Mm -hmm. The cocaine market is where we're really concerned right now. Um, But the opioid market is like, Right now, generally, people who use opioids on a regular basis are aware that their supply contains usually primarily or even exclusively fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Um, So yes, carry Narcan. Keep it in a cool, dry place. Don't Mm -hmm. expose it to extreme temperatures. Don't have it like swinging around and hitting stuff and exposed to light and stuff like that. Just try to keep it like in a backpack in a place where it won't be 
mm-hmm. fucked up. Um, and again, carry it everywhere. Like the one thing that I want to avoid in this situation is festival people. And I'm, mm-hmm. you know, look at me, I'm a festival people. Yeah. <laughs> um, festival folks hoarding Narcan, which means that people are having, people have like six or seven doses on them at any given time and they only bring it to festivals and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Or they just like keep it in a hot drawer in their house and don't bring it anywhere. Like, please, yes, if you're going to have Narcan, make sure that you can apply it to anybody who needs it. Mm -hmm. Um, And keep an eye out for real. I have personally encountered fentanyl overdoses in the Mm -hmm. wild. um, And there have been times that I have not had Narcan on me. Mm -hmm. And that also will change your life. Right. So um, that's, yeah, that's that's the gist of it. Mm Um, get familiar with the recovery position as well. The recovery position is a really good thing to use for people who are unconscious for unknown reasons, who are breathing and okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the most common reason I see for people who are passed out at festivals is that they're shit-faced. Mm-hmm. And if you Narcan someone who's shit-faced, they're not going to, it's, they're just going to like, uh, yeah, like yeah, roll yeah. over and go back to bed. <laughs> oh, like, geez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's so many different scenarios here too, because we um a- after the situation, I've spoken to like a couple different people about scenarios, and a few things um came up in general, and they weren't opioid opioid related at all. Like some of them were de- dehydration or just like oh, we were oh, I experienced a similar situation, but we were against the rail the entire day and didn't leave our spot baking in the sun, didn't drink water. And then my friend passed out. And it's like, you hear so many scenarios like that too. And so it's important to think about all of the things leading up to those moments as well. Not just like avoiding picking up a ground score and taking random drugs, but also all of the things leading up to that. And I've, I've been in so many different scenarios where we've had friends who like their water runs out in the middle of a set. And luckily we have each other to lean on and support, but it, I just can't stress enough, like doing these things in advance to make sure that you're set up for a position of, of, you know, being as safe as you possibly can be. And we talked a lot about test kits in the last episode. So I'm going to link that here, you guys as well. I, we don't have to spend too much time there, but testing your substances as well. Like you guys said, you're seeing an increase in fentanyl. Um, anything new on the, the test kit front that you want to touch on though? Um, not at the moment, really. I. I'm just like a total broken record about this, but Mm -hmm. if you're testing your drugs, which you all should be, you need to be reading our instructions front to back, back to front in the bathtub, upside down in your sleep with your Mm -hmm. friends, read everything on the instructions, Mm -hmm. please. We just spent a year and a half revitalizing. Sorry, the ferrets in my bedding. (laughs) The drug checking front, really the the changes that we've made have just been to like improving the quality of our instructions making mm-hmm. sure that our instructions are like as easy to follow as humanly possible as ferretly possible mm-hmm. and um that's that's it for the moment yeah but we're always working on making things easier to use and implement so mm-hmm. always keep an eye out you know perfect yeah and then anything else on site at events because I know like we've talked about a little bit about like the lack of harm reduction actually on site. And so I've seen certain instances like for electric forest, for example, in the campgrounds, they had, um, Oh God, I'm going to forget the name of it right now. The brainery, they had the brainery, which was like different workshops and things like that. So they did have certain things on the subject matter, but, um, just in general, like other than knowing where the medical tents are, is there anything else people would need to like know about resources wise that would be at their disposal on site and it's probably different event to event Mm -hmm. med Mm -hmm. tents are a good one but one that I would really really recommend is getting familiar with where a sanctuary is if an event offers like a a crisis support or just like a distress support space basically Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of different ways that sanctuaries are implemented some of them are specifically geared towards um, only being part of medical. Some of them are their own standalone things that are far away from medical, which is always a problem. Like you always mm-hmm. want to have the sanctuary close to medical. Um, some of them are run by the event itself. Some of them are outsourced. So really just get familiar with what each individual event you're at offers because sanctuary spaces are a really good way of, they're just kind of like an intermediate zone. So you can kind of tune into yourself and figure out what's going on with your body mm-hmm. and with your mind. So. Um, the dehydration thing 
there's just so many basic physiological needs that people neglect at festivals and they're like, yeah. oh my God, I feel horrible and I just fainted. And I'm I like, yeah, eaten because all day. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. haven't eaten any food. You're exerting yourself three times as much as normal. You're sweating. Mm-hmm. There are extreme temperatures. Your electrolyte balance is off. Mm-hmm. Um, like even at EDC this year, I spent some time um, because I work ground control occasionally. Um, even at ADC, I spent some time dealing with some electrolyte related issues where people would come in with mm-hmm. uncontrollable tremors while on LSD. And they'd be like, I have these like horrible tremors and like aches and my mm. fingers are um, like involuntarily curling. There's a word for that medically that I can't remember. Mm-hmm. And I would ask them, did you eat food today? Did you drink water? And they'd be like, yeah, I've had tons of water. I haven't had any food, which is a recipe for hyponatremia which is that mm. you have too little salt to water ratio. So we feed them some cashews and all their, their spasms go away. And right, right. Little stuff like that. It's like basic things. Mm-hmm. Body need food to be happy. Like prioritize right. real food at festivals. It really changes everything. For sure. Real sleep, real food. Well, there's, I think like, and this is why I, I do this is because like, I know the attitude people have, like I've been there. I have, you know, I'm in the scene. Like I know the attitude people have with this and it's like, <clears throat> not necessarily like a pride. I mean, for some people it could be a pride thing, but there almost is this thing of like, oh yeah, I'm going to be doing this later. So like, I'm, I know I'm not going to eat for eight hours and like, yeah, whatever, exactly. like there's like I that attitude. Harder. Exactly. Yeah. So like yeah. there is that attitude and it's like, it's ridiculous. Like you just need to be careful with that. And I, I want to stress too, cause I had written this note down about having a buddy system because I've seen like, just with my core, like Ray famine festival group. Now they're just such wonderful people. And I can't stress enough, like the conversations that we've all had and having like a sober friend in the scenario, like how helpful that's been in past mm-hmm. scenarios and just looking out for each other, like has probably saved lives in more ways than we know. And even in the situation we were in, when we were like unpacking everything, we were like, honestly, as traumatizing as it was, thank God it was our group that witnessed that because we have so many years of experience and we knew exactly what to do, but like, say it had been somebody else who was also fucked up or something and they wasted time or like they panicked or something like that. We were like, maybe we were supposed to be there at that time to to help these people. But, um, I just can't stress enough also like, you know, having other people who are aware of like your plans for the night, family and friends, knowing where you are, like having your phone charged again, like knowing where help is throughout the event, but, um, not being embarrassed or ashamed to like tell people if you're experiencing something that doesn't feel right. Like being vocal about that too, is extremely important. Yeah, and there's a high degree of humility required when we're conveying what did or did not happen to other people, mm-hmm. especially when we're talking about someone else's body. Mm-hmm. That's a very sensitive topic. Yeah, having the humility to be like, I don't really, I can't say for sure what happened. Here's what I witnessed. Mm-hmm. If people would communicate more like that when they're talking about what has happened at events, we would be seeing very different reporting, we'd be seeing very different levels of understanding of what other people are going through um a number of times that people have run up to me saying i need narcan someone's overdosing and it's someone who's tripping balls on acid and is like being Mm. weird and i'm like well it's great Mm. that you are aware that there is an issue here i'm Mm -hmm. not here to shame you for a problem that you did not create Mm -hmm. this is a systemic issue that we even have fentanyl on the market in the first place Mm -hmm. It filled a niche for more potent, easily trafficable substances. And many people involved in the drug trade are escaping poverty. Mm -hmm. Um, It is not your fault that you are not a drug expert. But before making statements like, I think it's fentanyl, we need Narcan, um, Mm -hmm. it would be wise to do a little bit of digging into what fentanyl actually is and does, what an opioid overdose actually looks like. And some psychedelic crisis care, like the manual of psychedelic support is a good place to start. Um, Mm -hmm. Knowing where the sanctuaries are, defer to people who have a little bit more specialization than you do because it's okay to not be specialized. Mm -hmm. Um, Which brings me to another really, really important point, which Mm -hmm. is that EMTs on site at festivals are also not specialized. They're not Mm -hmm. drug experts. 
they're going right. to be able to tell a lot more with observations about a person's vital signs and what they might be experiencing health wise, but they're still not going to be able to make any sort of solid confirmatory statements about what drugs were or were not involved. Mm-hmm. So beware of any EMT or paramedic that says, oh, this drug was responsible. They don't mm-hmm. have the required equipment to say that. They can't. Right. They can make suggestions and say, I'm not sure, but it looks to me like this might be possible. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But do not take that and run with it. That's why Dance Safe has to do so many debunking articles is mm-hmm. because people hear medics be like, oh, well, we think it was this. And someone's like, medics said it was this. Right. And it's like, okay, <laughs> what does the lab not say? The, that's not Bible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So just be honest about the limitations of what you know. I love it. This is such valuable information. I, I mean, I learned a ton and it, it helps even me just like with the wording that I use and like how, like what you sharing, what you witness versus like making claims. So mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. has just been like a tremendous amount of information. And thank you again for, for sharing all this. I want to make sure we covered everything. I know we have, we can dive into so much more, but um, yeah. I, I just hope that people like leave. Cause obviously you know, we're in the middle of summer festival season, but just, there's going to be so many instances in this, of of this in the future. And it's important for you to think not only about like your own safety, but your friends and the other people you witness. Cause like we said, like we are a community. So being aware of the things that are happening around you too, I talk about a lot of the time. So it's like not having tunnel vision and, and being observant and noticing behaviors and people and being able to, to get them help. Um, so I think, I mean, moving forward, I know this is a systemic issue, but I hope that we have more harm reduction available at events. We're in the same place we were a year ago <laughs> talking about this. It's right. Like, I, know I know much has changed on it's... that front. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, been, there have been some improvements, like it does get okay. better. Um, being able to collaborate with Grizz is really big. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to have our stuff present at various um let's just say and I can't say with much detail but let's just Mm -hmm. say that we have more visibility and more presence than we've been able to have before at many events um, some of which have never even considered allowing us on site so there is progress it is agonizingly slow Mm -hmm. always Mm -hmm. um but definitely one of the biggest things that I could recommend anyone do is get familiar with the many reasons why someone might lose consciousness be able to differentiate between not awake, not breathing, and no pulse, Mm -hmm. um, which is hard to do even for medical professionals without equipment sometimes, because when you put your finger on someone else's body, you'll sometimes feel your own pulse in your finger, for instance. Mm. Um, If you're in the middle of a crowded area and you're trying to watch the rise and fall of someone's chest, it could be really difficult to tell if they're breathing or not. Sure. Um, So just like, do your best call in medical professionals, Mm -hmm. take information as observation only. And you can make kind of guess or check extrapolations to try and respond to someone's needs in the moment. Like if someone has lost consciousness on the ground, you don't have to just stand there with your hands on your hips and be like, oh man, well, I'm observing this right now and not Mm -hmm. do anything action item wise, but like be mindful of the limitations of what you can know. Sure. And I think the last thing too, just to wrap up is any advice for somebody who witnesses a scenario like this, like just how to, how to deal with that scenario. Cause like, I know I've Mm. spoken to people before. I personally am a really big fan of the four hours on hour and a half off thing where you at a festival or any event kind of plan to give yourself at least three or four hour and a half long breaks throughout the day, an hour and a half at the start of the day, an hour and a half in the middle, an hour and a half in the evening, an hour and a half at night. Um, That's just how it works for me. I prefer it that way because the pressure to be in the mood and in the zone at a festival, especially, but really any music event, because you Mm -hmm. paid to be there. It's a one-time thing. It won't happen again for a while, whatever, um, can make it really difficult to engage in basic self-care routines. Mm -hmm. but stepping away from the situation and saying, okay, I'm going to go take like however much time I need to do a cool down. Mm -hmm. Even if good morning, even if that means that you fall asleep for the night, I've had that happen a few times where you're experiencing, you experience a really intense emotional 
thing you witness something intense go through something intense at a festival and you're like well I just don't really feel like partying or even socializing Mm -hmm. and you go to bed at 10 p.m and that's fine Mm -hmm. um really getting settled and that being a possibility for yourself is important um but I always recommend starting with the basic physiological needs checklist am I hungry am I thirsty have I slept um am I hot or cold have I taken a dump recently? Mm-hmm. Um, all of the basic stuff that you would do to check why your baby is crying. Like you are a baby and you're crying. Right. So rock yourself to sleep for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, wrap yourself up in a blankie and watch people. Don't do anything. And when you're ready, you'll often know that it's time for you to talk to other people about what you experienced. You may or may not, mm-hmm. but it's okay to not want to unpack it immediately. Just make sure that you're taking care of your physical and mental form in the process. Sure. Perfect. No, that was so well said. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I I can imagine everybody handles like these situations very differently. And I I was proud of our friend group because I think it might have been aid, but one of our friends, like, because I was in the very emotional state of like, I want to get the fuck out of here. I want to go back to my bed. Just want to like end this night. And I was actually Mm -hmm. very grateful that our friend group is like, why don't we take a grounding moment and we kind of yep. like all stood in a circle and we literally like held hands we said thank you to the mm. forest for the weekend we had we were like Aww. literally all the beautiful things we had we, it was like a little moment and we were like why don't we just like sit on our pashminas and like hang out yeah. and just watch the last set and I'm actually so grateful we did that because then we were able to like regroup and still like take in everything Closure. from the whole weekend yeah and have like a little goodbye to our one of the best experiences ever so that was actually yeah. a really nice grounding moment to have as well, just to like check in with ourselves. But yeah, uh, dude, that mm-hmm. the process of engaging in something intentional like that is really powerful. And um, I have not lived in one place for a few years now, but when I do, I really enjoy bringing tea with me to events, herbal tea, mm-hmm. because herbal tea is like the ultimate grounding thing. You can make it as like, it's, a, it's like a quest. You have the mm-hmm. quest to make the tea it's a consumable, it's warm, it's comforting, it's non-stimulating, it's hydrating. You kill a lot of birds with one stone when you make nice herbal mm. tea. Yeah, and good to know. Um, yeah, it's often a really nice way of kind of like resettling into a groove after something tough, mm-hmm. um, giving yourself like a, a way to channel that kind of feeling of aimlessness into doing something for yourself and other people. It can be really nice to make other people tea in the process too, because it doesn't take anything else away from you. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a very pleasant way of kind of reorienting in the moment, figuring out what you need from there. Beautiful. Love it. Where can everybody connect with you and dance safe in this? (laughs) Literally, this is so cute. I can't, can't I know you can connect with dance safe on any (laughs) social media platform. We will not respond to your DMS on Reddit. I'm sorry. We don't have the capacity, but you can Mm -hmm. DM us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you can find us at dancesafe.org. And if you would like to pick up your own drug checking kit, we are the only drug checking kit, nonprofit drug checking kit manufacturer in the entire country. And we are the oldest. So you can grab materials from us at dancesafe.org slash shop. And we have all kinds of other merch there too. Um, so please feel free to participate in this movement with us as mm-hmm. well by signing up to volunteer where it says get involved on the website. Beautiful. Okay, cool. And I'm excited to see... Um everything coming out with Grizz that you guys are doing. What was the other organization that you guys are doing that with? Um, So Good Night Out Vancouver was the other org that we were, this isn't like a formal partnership with Grizz. We Mm -hmm. collaborated with Grizz to develop this thing and we'll just be Mm -hmm. supporting at the shows um, because the Harmony Project is bigger than just us. Mm -hmm. But um, Good Night Out Vancouver is friends of ours in Vancouver, Canada. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones that we co-created the Healing is Power campaign which was our campaign awesome. about um power dynamics and consent in the music industry awesome and so you can see that on our instagram and there's a landing page on our website for that too if you're curious because that's all about like sexual assault and nightlife but also about just power dynamics in general which is really mm. big like things like grooming and idolization and sure we can all read think that of some- yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna link, I will link that. And then I want to link the other article that you mentioned as well um, with the yeah. breakdown. I'll grab that from you too. Beautiful. Cool. Thank you for being here as always. This was super informative and I hope you, you and the ferrets have a great time in London. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And thank you for having me and for covering these important topics.
Of course. All right, Rachel, hang tight. Everybody else will be back in a second with our Rave Culture Cast recap. Alrighty, you guys. I know that episode was a little chaotic and all over the place, but um, I think we got everything out of it that we wanted to. And there's clearly so much more to talk about on this subject. Um, I think it's good that we really just honed in on the actual situation itself and just got to like dive in on what to do. Um, but there's clearly so many more things we can talk about. So hopefully Rachel will be back for a part three at some point. Um, let me know in the comments, you guys. Share, like, comment whatever you do um if you really like this episode let me know um that would be a big help and again all the resources from dan safe will be linked down below along with the articles that rachel mentioned test kit information like please protect yourself out there educate yourself your friend group whoever send somebody this episode today if this saves a life that's all that matters to me and to rachel and the dance safe team which is why we do this so Thank you guys again so much for being here and for listening. Um, I want to do our Rave Culture Cast recap here. I just have a couple quick things. Uh, we talked about this on the episode, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Harmony Project, which is Grizz, uh, Grizz announced this is his new harm reduction project along with um, Dan Safe and Good Night Out Vancouver. So it's really cool that they're doing this. Um, so this focuses on ensuring a safe space at Grizz's events by offering services for those who are experiencing a situation where they do not feel safe. Um, it debuted at Grizzmas this past July, um, which is really cool. And it's going to be at more of his events moving forward. So he posted in a tweet, I've been looking for a way to reinforce that Grizz shows are a safe space that we can all be ourselves, love one another and maximize the good vibes all while respecting each other's boundaries. So this is why we are in are debuting the Harmony Project at Christmas in July, which is really cool. So he has more information about that um, on his Twitter, and I will link that down below, you guys. But very, very excited about um, this partnership and seeing artists promoting harm reduction. Um, we have a cancellation of an event. So Brownies and lemonade, Lemonades, I don't know, I just said that, Brownies and Lemonade, period, uh, announced that they are canceling their lake brownies and lemonade show this year so they did post um that after many years of producing live events our team has always pushed through every op obstacle in order to make a show happen um but after the brownie and lake oh my god brownies and lemonade lake experience last august we were so thrilled with how it came together and how it resonated with artists and friends and most importantly our community um, however given the current economic climate rising costs and nearly every area of event production and completely different event landscapes than we could have predicted a year ago we are simply unable to deliver the quality experience that our fans deserve so they're going to be um, issuing refunds, I believe. It said it may take more than 30 days or more to refund. Um, the one thing I want to mention about this too is that this was a pollen experience, which some of you guys might know what pollen is, but um, they're basically like an event curator. They sell different like packages to all different types of live events, not just music, but um, they do have like a lot of travel, uh, like excursions and things like that. So this was a pollen experience. But on that note, there is some trouble in paradise with pollen. According to this article on digitalmusicnews.com, um, the top executive departed over ethics concerns as the company declares it's no longer a venture-backed loss-making technology company. So it sounds like there's a lot of things being switched up at pollen right now. Um, pollen, formerly called Verve, laid off about a third of its workforce Uh which was interesting. So I think over 200 employees were laid off and obviously there's been some issues with events being canceled and um, refunds not being issued. So there's something going on there. So I just wanted to mention that because I know a lot of people buy packages through Pollen. So just be wary of that right now and just make sure that everything is moving forward as planned and that there are updates on the event that you're going to. Um, I have had so many friends do Pollen experiences who have had the best time. So I'm not entirely sure. Maybe there's a lot of things being switched up at the company right now, but I will link that article down below if you guys want to check that out. So that is everything I have for you in our rave, rave culture. I can't talk today. <laughs> I got I talk so fast. I literally don't take a breath, as you guys notice. Uh, so we're just going to leave all this in because I'm just tripping over my words today because we've been filming for a long time. Um, anyway, deep breath. That's everything for my Rave Culture Cast recap, you guys. <laughs> uh, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Like I said, this kind of just felt very necessary to me after what had happened. It was a no-brainer to reach out to Rachel from Dance Safe to do something and to talk about it. 
Um, like I said, it's it was a traumatizing experience for myself and my group. I'm sure a lot of other people have gone through similar experiences. I've had a lot of conversations with friends about this who have also come forward and told me their experiences with medical emergencies at shows. So it happens. You just never know when it's going to happen. And that's the scary part. So you just really want to be prepared. And that's what I hope this did. Um, there's so many things you can do to make sure you have a safe experience beforehand. And then there's so many things to educate yourself about in this space, especially if you are dabbling in substances. And then there's things you should just be aware of, of course, if you you know, see something happening in the crowd, of course. like We are a community. There might be strangers all around you, but at the end of the day, we're all taking care of each other. We need to look out for each other. So there are things you should pay attention to. And this is why I say like, know where medical help is um, and like Rachel spoke about be able to assess what's happening in a situation um, without making too many assumptions about it so thank you guys so much for listening to us today we really appreciate it you can connect with us online at rave culture cast on all of the platforms along with our Facebook group community and our discord server come join the family guys we would love to have you um, if you enjoyed the episode today rate review, subscribe, share it with a friend or somebody you think will find this information valuable means the world to me, you guys. So thank you for being here and I will see you next Wednesday in a new episode. Bye guys.